Hello, everyone. Growth is key to achieve long-term prosperity and well-being for all. At Bridgewood, this is our mission and every day of session, to develop remarkable networks that bridge and deliver growth opportunities. If, like us, you believe sustainable growth is key, this is your podcast. Welcome to Let's Scale, the Bridgewood podcast powered by Scale Up Valley that puts growth at the center of conversations. We are Paul Morgado and Ana Paula Reis, the founders of Bridgewood, and your hosts for the next hour. Today, we have with us Libby Dale and Mike Crooks, co-founders of Smart Measures, joining us from Australia. Mike, tell us about Smart Measures. Uh, so Smart Measures is an AI-based startup that's focused on helping large enterprises retain their customers. So we've always had the belief that large customers can do a lot more to keep their customers happy. And we've got we've pulled together a solution to help them actually predict when a customer is going to leave and then help them uh, keep the customer, help them retain the customer. It's a closed loop system. So we've got two different AIs happening and it um, is always learning. It's feeding back off each, each AI feeds off the other and it's all about maximizing saving customers. Um, we launched the product in 2018 um, and uh, we focus on a few industries that have got a high level of customer uh, churn. The customers, there's quite a high level of customers leaving. So that's the energy retailers, uh, telcos, financial services are the main areas. Okay, so tell me, can you just tell me, uh, uh, I'd like to understand uh, what kind of problems are you exactly solving in term not the kind but what measures would be if i have that kind of problem i would call you what if i have a small problem a big problem what size of of problem should i oh what, think what of size of problem one? yeah okay um so um it typically works best when you have a lot of customers to learn the past behavior of Right, so it's an AI system. It needs a lot of yeah. history to learn from, right? So it doesn't work so well for small companies. It's more mm -hmm. aimed at the large companies where there's a, a lot of history that you can look at the different patterns of why people leave. So you've got to have a lot of customers, at least 200,000 customers, right? Um, and the other thing is that um, uh, because we're so passionate about, um, like, we're, we're very benefit focused. So we commit that we're going to get a certain level of accuracy. It's not just about here's a prediction tool. We're going to save you a certain volume of customers. And to do that, we have to get a certain level of accuracy in our prediction. And we have to get a certain level of accuracy in saving, right? They're two different issues. Mm -hmm. So the first issue, getting a certain level of accuracy in prediction that's much harder to do if you're only losing 5% of your customers. You know, the accuracy, to get 70% accuracy on 5%, you don't have a very big window of error, right? It's a very small error window. So you have to have a reasonable level of churn. So it suits customers with a lot of, sorry, clients with a lot of customers and customers that have a reasonable level of churn, 15, 25. Some of our customers had up to 50% churn. They were lo losing half of their customers every year. Um, so that's the sort of business okay. that we're talking about. Okay. Um, Mike, that, that, that's div you know that there are different uh, companies addressing the, the topic of churn. So yep. if we had to ask you what is your area of innovation and your strength, what do you uh, answer to us? Um, so um, there's many things that sort of are setting us apart from uh, other players out there. I, I guess one of the very first things, and this is more a mindset thing. Uh, so one of the very first things is we haven't, we didn't come into this as a software development business, right? We're not a software house by default. We've come at this from working within the enterprise clients, understanding the frustrations and their, their internal challenges, the fact that they've got a lot of data, but it's very hard for them to do much with it. Uh, all of those things is our background. So our very first differentiator is we've come at it from being inside the enterprise ourselves. 
Um, the second differentiator is we don't take a, a natural approach to data. We're not data scientists, we're engineers. We take an mm -hmm. engineering approach to data, not a data science approach to data. And they're very different. An engineer is all about signal to noise ratio. A data scientist is, oh, this data is a little bit different to that data. I've got to cleanse the data before I can use the data. So they have a different approach. So that's the second differentiator. The third differentiator is we, um, it's all about benefits. It's not about prediction. It's about giving an outcome to the client, right? It's about saving customers or whatever the outcome needs to be, usually saving customers for us. Um, so it's not just about predicting, but it's actually about retaining the customers. And that's where you've got to think outside the square. You've got to bring the behavioral neuroscientists in. You have to understand people's mindset. It's not just the technology, right? So it's a combination of technology and behavioral neuroscience. And then the last thing I'd say is we're using two AI engines coupled with feedback loops. Each of them reinforces the other. Um, one does prediction and one finds the best plan to save each customer. Okay, so uh, a lot of passion going into, into your explanation. It's wonderful to hear and our audience doesn't see it, but uh, we can, so it, it's really impressive. Uh, can you explain us uh, how and why you have created Smart Measures? Oh, okay. <laughs> um, look, uh, I think that the thing we're most passionate about, the thing that we, gets us out of bed, is not the technology. It's helping enterprises um, treating their customers better, right? Making their customers happier. Um, so because we've come out of enterprise, we were constantly getting frustrated by, oh, you can't do this for that reason, or you can't do that because we don't have the data. So we were in there experiencing the problem firsthand ourselves. Um, so um, because we understood that, um, we eventually decided, okay, well, we're getting just we're just getting frustrated inside the enterprise. So let's go start a startup and solve the problem and because we knew what we wanted ourselves to solve the problem, right? So that's how this thing all got started. Um, and perhaps if I elaborate with a couple of short stories to show you how we came to the, this conclusion, you know, we worked in a large online advertising business and we're in the technology space, we could start to see when advertisers started churning, we started to look into the reasons for them churning. And it was interesting because Mike was managing the space that had the performance of the advertisers. So you would think that if I'm an advertiser and I'm getting lots of high performance on my ads, online ads, I'm likely to stay. And I managed the self-service or the customer portal. And we, between us, could see that there wasn't, it wasn't always a straight correlation that if I got good performance on my ads, I would stay. We saw that it was related to customer behavior and customer engagement. If customers were engaged in, in added, editing their own ads, they even if the ad didn't perform, they felt that they were part of this and part of the reason that the ad didn't perform. They didn't just blame us. So they tended to stay. And so we could see this correlation and, and we would try and talk to our, other, our executives about it and they were not so interested. And then one of the other key factors, and I'm sure the, the, the listeners of the podcast would know that all large companies have their share of operational issues that impact you know, different groups of customers. And this is true stories. One week we would see 55,000 customers' bills sent out and they'd have a broken link in them. So the emails would go out for the bills and the, and the link would be broken. Now, we were a company that charged fees on late fees for bills. So, of course, if you're a customer and you can't click on your link, you're automatically not trusting us any, anyway that when, we're not going to charge you a fee and we've given you a broken link to a bill. Then, then the next week, you know, there was a publishing problem that some of the ads that the customers were editing weren't being updated online. And that was about 100,000 customers. And then a few weeks later, there was you know, 20,000 customers were sent, were incorrectly charged for a late payment. So we were sitting around saying, 
Wow. Imagine if you were a customer that in that first week got the broken link. In the next week, your ad update didn't happen. In the next week, you know, you got incorrectly charged for a late fee. And our bosses and the senior executives said, can we tell? Can we tell if a customer has had all of those three things? And you'd know that businesses are built as silos. We, we couldn't tell. And so that was really the start of Mike and I trying to pulling together these ideas that, wow, you know, there's certain things that we're able to, that we, we should be able to do. Yeah, so we sort of knew, we could tell, like the, the, the business has the data, right? So it's just a matter of pulling the data together uh, and interpreting it in the right way, not as a data scientist, but as a, as a, a pragmatic engineer approach to the data, pulling it all together. And because I had a background in AI, we could see, well, if we did it like this, we're going to get much better accuracy, much better than the other standard tools that you're going to get out of Microsoft or out of Google. It's a completely different approach. And because of that, and because of the thing just constantly learns, it, you know, we and because we could sort of then proactively, because we're benefit driven, because we could then proactively reach out to those that are at risk, the, you know, we, we knew we were on to a bit of a winner. Okay. Uh is it possible to to tell us more about the uh, the company creation well the, this change from another type of life for, to have a company uh, the start of the company uh, the first client so tell us uh, more about these practical aspects of smart measures um i guess in the early days um uh, we were sort of expecting, because we, we had um, lofty goals, you could argue, right? We were sort of expecting, okay, we're going to have an, an AI prediction system. We're, because um, um, the, a lot, there's two types of AI. There's black boxes and white boxes. Um, and the black box, there's a lot of issues about um, the whole, um, uh, what's, what's the word for it? the um, AI ethics, right? There's a lot of issues around AI ethics and black box. Um, so we went down the white box approach. Now that sort of means it's gonna tell you here are the contributing factors, right? So our lofty goal was, oh, this is great. It's gonna give us all the silver bullets. If I fix this in my backend system, if I fix this, this process in my, the way I interact with customers, if I do this, then I'm going to solve all my churn problems, all my customer retention problems. Unfortunately, that didn't pan out. Um, <laughs> so while you do get insights into um, the contributing factors, in practice, when you actually get down to it, and because we're driven by the benefit, not by the predictions, when you get down to actually saving customers, you find, unfortunately, that a lot of those contributing factors vary widely from customer to customer. So you can't rely on, here's all the silver bullets. You do get, for an individual customer, here are all the things that contributed, but those factors vary a lot, okay? So we realized that the real value is not so much in the silver bullets because you don't really get silver bullets. The real value is taking a behavioral neuroscientist to understand your customer's mindset and then combining that with an AI that finds and picks on the exact treatment for that exact customer to maximize saving or to retaining them. That's what we learned. At so the, at the yeah. cheapest price. At the, yeah. So yeah. often, um, sorry, uh, uh, getting onto another story now. But, so, <laughs> the great well, story. Oh, yeah. <laughs> often uh, uh, look um it's amazing what the system will dig up that you don't expect right um so often you think oh um uh, this price is always a big factor right you often think price is a big factor mm -hmm. uh, our clients think price is a big factor um but and so they, they go to the trouble of, oh, we're going to set aside this budget. We're going to give away a whole lot of discounts or a whole lot of vouchers of some monetary value, right? We're going to give away money. Um, so let's park this budget to give away money. Um, so yes, we can, we can definitely identify who's at risk. 
and we can say, okay, well, these particular at risk have got a high profitability. So maybe spend your money on the ones that you make more money out of, right? So we can tell them stuff like this. Um, um, but when, but because we're so data, we're so benefit data driven, we always use control groups. So we can always prove how much every particular treatment plan is going to save. We know what percentage improvement we're going to get for each cohort, for each treatment plan. So we tested it, right? We just go test this using control groups. So regardless of whatever else the organization's doing, even if they've got 10 other churn reduction programs going, it doesn't matter. We, we know against their own control group how much improvement we're going to make regardless of what they're up to. So test this, give away money, test a, a neuroscientist with a carefully worded, virtually free email, test those two. Free versus give away $100 or 100 euro, doesn't matter what currency. Um, and we could prove that if you pick on the right message and the right wording, we will save more customers than giving away money. So big savings, unexpected, right? It's the gut feel tells you you should be able to save people by giving away money. Not always the case. Um, there's studies that come out of the US that show people will buy based on price, but usually the trigger to invest all of the time to make a decision to move is not price-based. It's based on a perceived indifference. The customer does not believe that their supply values them. Um, okay. You are triggering a, a question from my part. I would like to understand because you're, talk, you're mentioning uh, an engineer, a data-driven approach that's undeniable. But I, uh, I can also hear a very deep uh, sense of client advocacy and understanding. I would like to know, was there a aha moment to really start smart measures from your part? That moment that you were talking to clients and understood, aha. It, it was really, as Mike has said, prediction is nothing unless you're going to use it effectively to retain customers. So our key difference, yes, we are engineers and, and, and our key difference, however, is that customer advocacy. And our background is delivering business cases inside large enterprise. And our frustration was always that, you know, there was always promise and never delivery. So we absolutely understood that the difference in, with what we wanted our company to do was to deliver those outcomes. And we were in a, in a um, innovation competition in, in Melbourne in 2018. And when they asked us what our differentiation was, it really was that taking the technology and we've got a really solid technology in prediction because we use so many more sources and we're great at pulling data out of legacy systems and there's all that technology side of it. But if you accurately know, and we, our accuracy is tested every week with our clients, we test who's left last week and how many did the AI get right. If you don't do anything with it, you are nowhere. So it became clear pretty early on that we needed somebody that was going to do something entirely different to marketing speak because most enterprise only knows marketing speak. We were initially talking, talking to um, operations people and operations people who look after service, they were very good at the service aspects, but they didn't own the customer numbers. So we, we needed a, a, um, a neuroscientist to help us convince our buyer inside our clients that they needed to let us develop these treatment messages with our neuroscientist to cut through the busy customer's noise, noisy day. So you can imagine these messages that we're crafting they're being sent to disaffected customers, someone that the AI thinks is going to leave. So every word in every email or SMS to them has to be carefully chosen and carefully crafted. And a behavioral neuro, neuroscientist is the one, the skill, the professional we needed. So we pretty quickly engaged 
um, we, we, had, we did no one, a neuroscientist. And of course, she was so excited to take her, her expertise beyond research um, into this space. And she really has made the difference. And, and she has, we, together we've uncovered um, behavioral hacks that help enterprises communicate with disaffected customers to retain them. And as Mike said a minute ago, one of our key findings was that we were actually giving away money and it went up to $100 in some cases, the vouchers. And those treatment plans that were giving away money didn't perform as well as some of the straight service messaging that were able to portray the message that we cared about them as, a, as, a, as an enterprise. This enterprise cares about you. You're not just a number. We're here to help you um, and so on. And so we were against control groups, as Mike's described. We were able to test and show the, show the client. Um, and there's a case study on our website, if anybody wanted to look at it, to show just how much better we were able to perform and, and what the client thought of it. So... Maybe I don't know if you, you want to talk about this uh, uh, case study that is on your website or other client, but tell us about, uh, well, either recent or most rep representative customer project. Uh, tell us a bit about how do you apply what uh, you have just described in a, a very the, well, maybe I'll manner. just describe the pro, the type of project, and then Mike can talk about what the learnings were. But the 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 top, the project was a proof of value, where we would run smart measures on a hundred thousand of their customers over a period of four months, just to prove three things: one, that their data was capable of being used to predict with accuracy who was going to leave, because that's always a question for our clients in the early days. The second was that we could effectively design treatment plans, which when we test in the method that we described against control groups, showed that we could actually retain their customers with these messages. And then that if you were able to roll it out more broadly, that there was a solid business case and a solid ROI on um, running the prediction and then running the treatment to retain customers. Um, so we did that with the, the um, case study that's online is Simply Energy, who's a, a French company owned by a French company, Engie. And so their, their, their subsidiary in Australia is called Simply Energy and that's who we did it with. So in going through that, we, we were intending to try and show we could reduce churn by um, at least 20%. So that, that, and you'll see that in the business case. So um, Mike was going to take us through what the learnings were from it. Yeah. Um, so I, I guess uh, one key learning for us, I'll talk about the, what the client learned in a second, but one key learning for us was... Um, uh, there's a lot of enterprises nowadays are much more data driven in their decisions, right? So they're not just going to take on face value that, oh, you know, here's the capital investment and here's the predicted returns. Um, so here's the hockey stick that shows in year three that we've made a lot of money. Um, they want actual facts, so the fact that we were using control groups, they really loved, like they love the fact that we can tell on a treatment by treatment basis, on a cohort by cohort, exactly what percentage of improvement in churn or customer re retention we're going to achieve. So they love these, these sort of facts. Um, and um, so, so when you move beyond that, um, the fact that... Um, um, uh, that we can use these treatment plans and the, the fact that um, uh, so, so, some, some of the learnings about these treatment plans um, surprised us as well as the client. So uh, I'll give you an example. Um, maybe, let's say, nearly 10 months ago now, uh, we did some tests on some treatment plans. 
And we, we were seeing that um, the same, exactly the same message delivered via an email, delivered via an SMS, the SMS was outperforming the email significantly. This is 10 months ago. Now, so we have a policy that everything has to get retested. Right? You don't just stick with it and assume it's always going to work. You retest. Every six um, months. It, it, so we went to retest these, these same messages six months later, exactly the same channels, email versus SMS. It's completely flipped. Email now outperforms SMS on the same message. And the reason is COVID. We wouldn't have predicted this, but the reason is COVID. And the why it's COVID is that um, when COVID um, increased, everybody was at home a lot. They, were, they started to get a lot more spam SMS around fake deliveries and other sorts of fake testing. Or there was a lot of stuff related to um, everybody's receiving a lot more deliveries and everybody's receiving a lot more information about testing and st uh, things like that. That was caused, and so there were a lot of these scams happening. It was causing people to become more mistrustful of SMSs to the point that a lot of people now would not even click on a link inside an SMS. The behavior and the benefit we get is greater now for emails than it was for SMS six months later. Um, so there, there's things like this that you don't envisage. You have to be constantly testing. Uh, so they, they, that's why they, uh, these client, and this is the same client that wants us, now wants to roll us out through Europe, right? Um, they're really happy with, we're, we're sort of, um, you know, they were sceptical, but they are no longer sceptical that we can deliver for them. And we, uh, yeah, and we okay. deliver quite any, anyway. So let yeah. me put my, myself in the, in the shoes of a client and, and ask you, what would be the journey that uh, I will have? Uh, I would have with the smart measures. Uh, let me uh, assume that I don't even know that I have important churn. So, what would be the journey? I would uh, call smart measures and ask you, hey, I, I saw something related to you on Bridgewater or whatsoever. Uh, how can you help them? Yeah, there's a um, process that we can take um, customers through, which is a if they're a Bridgewatt connection through a free consultancy that we will do to help them assess what their customer churn issue is, the size of the problem, and what um, it might be costing their business. So that's a short consultancy that we can start with. Then as after we have together understood how important or how much of a priority customer churn is in their business, then we can start to talk about, well, how can we test it? So the initial stages, we will do a, a bridge what uh, free consultancy to help them assess what data they should be collecting, what churn might be costing their business and what might be possible for them to do about it. Now, if they want to go away then and start collecting the data that we help them identify that they should be collecting, that, that first consultancy, we do an assessment to see the, their maturity level um, in, in around the topic of, of customer retention. And so we'll give them the results of that assessment and then we can engage with them to answer further questions and help them start to collect the right data. Um, once they decide that customer churn is something that they really do want to address and we together work out how much they're likely to save their business and what the impact will be on their business, then we typically engage in a proof of value which enables them to test smart measures actually running in their business. Now, our, with our proof of value, we bring with us the, an, an AI and data expert, a CX expert. We bring the neuroscientist in. Um, obviously, we run the software and we help them run the program. We help them design the treatment plans and we measure the outcomes for that four-month period 
And that's a fixed price contract that includes all of that. Um, and then at the end of it, we assess to see whether how much did it save? And then once we determine how much each of the treatment plants um, have saved, we write up recommendations and we help them. If they decide that they want to proceed, we help them with building a business case to justify the investment of proceeding in rolling out smart measures more broadly. And it's, it's important to realise that... Um, we we realise there's there's risk here for the enterprise, right? Particularly in those early stages. So the the whole point of the proof of value is to demonstrate, and there's an early milestone in that proof of value. And the whole point of that is to prove using their own data that we can achieve a seventy percent or more accuracy on who's going to leave. If we don't hit that milestone, then there's no payment. So the whole point of this is to reduce the risk for the client because every client that we've encountered so far, um, our data is too bad. You're not going to be able to achieve anything with our data. But uh, so that the it's to remove that risk. Um, it's a low it's a low touch approach, right? We um, we've come from enterprise. We know how complicated projects can get very quickly. Um, so we take a low touch. There's very little IT involved. It's just a pure CSV extracts from lots of different backend systems. We take the responsibility of pulling it all together. Um, so low yeah. risk, low touch to okay. try and get them to a point that they're comfortable and th that this thing has got some potential. Um, yeah. Well, one of the things that sometimes arises during this, uh, I would say uh, we call it, is that some clients, and I see this for many years, does not take in consideration the churn related to the clients stopping make revenue to the company. So the some of the clients just count as churn when they lose a client and not yeah. when the clients start to reduce their average uh, revenue uh, uh, with yeah. the company. Well, How part, part of that is we... Um... In, in when we're running, once we're up and running, we help help our clients understand which customers they're interested in keeping as well. So I'll, I'll, I'll cover this first and then come to your particular point, Paolo. So we quarantine unprofitable customers, customers that have um, um, some outstanding debt beyond 90 days. There's a list of um, criteria for our clients that, they don't want to spend any money retaining these customers. So it, just leave them. So that's a quarantine that we put them in. Now, the point that you're making, and these customers would automatically go into quarantine if they were running a program with us at the moment. If, it, if and we'll, we will use an example of in the energy retail space, they can be a customer that's not spending much, but they can't be spending zero. But in a credit card, you could be really not using the card and the credit card company could have the full cost of running your account and issuing you statements and so on, and you're not getting any revenue for it. So we would help businesses really understand what the true cost and in that and in that yeah. example yeah. um a customer a customer who's not using their credit card they yeah. might be they're costing a business more than a churned yeah. credit card yeah. customer yeah. because they still have the operational cost to send statements yeah. send replacement cards and so yeah. on yeah the, I, I guess um a slightly different slant uh, another angle on that is um uh, our system's not uh, focused on just one outcome. So as an example, it doesn't have to be they must have left before we can do a prediction. You could predict, um, oh, this, this particular customer's, their usage of the cloud card is declining to the point that they're going to become unprofitable. That could be your prediction. You want to predict who is going to stop using your card and you want to reverse that, right? You want to stop that from occurring. So that could be your, your the goal that you're trying to improve um it doesn't have to be they've left um so it's how you define what yeah. you want to predict yeah so if you define this is what i want to predict i want to predict that a cardholder is going to become inactive 
then yeah. that's what you set the AI yeah. to predict. Yeah, it's just like uh, even for energy retailers, there's a um, like a secondary benefit where you can predict who's a bad debt, who's not going to pay their electricity bill. That's a separate prediction from the they're going to leave. Um, but you, there's nothing stopping you building a, the prediction engine saying, this is what I want you to tell me, and it'll go figure it out. Um, this is very interesting because well, uh, what the, and this is the, I would say the, the last point that I wanted to make with the, the, the experience with the client is very interesting because you have different sorts of KPIs, obviously for different sorts of sectors. For some sectors, you measure when the client starts to reduce revenue. For other sectors, you measure if the client is paying or not. So yep. uh, I imagine that you have a battery of these, uh, I would say, early signs that something could happen. And this is also a, a value added for a potential client. We, we thought that. We thought that we would be building up a library of answers. No. Every, and the reason is not obvious, but the reason is every business has their own practice and their own way of interacting with their customers. Um, so one business might have a process that takes them three months to get the customer ready to start billing. Another business might be able to do it the next day. Um, so, if, and they might have different KPIs and different, oh, as long as I get back to the customer within five days, I'm happy with that. Whereas another business might say, oh, no, the customer is more important. I need to get back to them within 24 hours. The, you need to let the AI work out what's important or not important. You can't have a battery. I, we thought this was, our, our, again, back to our lofty goals. We thought we would have, oh, we're going to build up all these recipes and all of these libraries of answers. No. Uh, we even even within the same country, the same industry, every solution, every prediction, if you like, answer, not answer, answer is the wrong word, every model that the, uh, it, uh, our software doesn't need to be, it's not hand built, it's a, a system, but it will go and create new models for it based on the data, right? Um, so every time we engage a client, it's always been a different model, mm. completely different. Um, and but as I was saying, Paolo, that sorry, as I was saying, Paolo, that yeah. there can be you can predict someone stop using the card. You can predict somebody going unprofitable in an energy retailer. You can predict. Um, they're not going to pay their bill. You can so there's yeah. a range of things that you can predict. Now, in terms of you know, when I'm talking to Mike, when I when I'm do, I'm leading the sales activity, and I talk to Mike about, well, could, can the prediction engine be trained to do this? It's pretty much there's that's one question, but the other very important question for any client is, what would be the treatment? You know, there was one exercise that we did recently to look at. Um, the drop off between gross sales and billable, you know, their channel partners in this business were bringing all their sales in, but not all of the sales um, that were turning to be billable and, and there's that that's an example in the credit card industry as well. So all the channels sell the card they get paid a commission, and then only a portion of the cards get activated. But our, one of our existing clients was asking us to help predict that. Now, Mike was looking at the data to see whether it could be predicted or not. But the quest, real question was, what would you do if you could predict it? You know, what action would you take? So for us, it's always the marriage of the prediction of a particular outcome with what How do we behavioural action can you take to intervene proactively to change the outcome? Yeah. And that's always that marriage is needed of that behavioural action to be taken to leverage what the AI is telling yeah. us. Other, otherwise, you're just a shiny toy. You're just a <laughs> propensity model that gives you some answers. But if it doesn't deliver the, the company, a, a, you know, a the concrete yeah. dollar, you know, value-based benefit, if you're not actually changing the business, then you're not getting it. The, the business is not getting any value out of it. Um, and I'm talking about uncertainty, can you tell us your perspective on of how did COVID and the current situation impact uh, the customer journey in terms of churn? 
Are there, do you see changes? What can be done about it? Um, in Australia, we originally saw um, churn drop with a client that we were working in. And I guess in, this was in 2020, we saw churn drop significantly, uh -huh. which was sad for us <laughs> because the business case didn't stack up, you know, when the, one, when the churn dropped a lot in the early stages of COVID. Um, but pretty quickly, then we started to see, in, say, in energy retail, we started to see customers um, feeling more comfortable with the big players. So the little players were not getting as much of the business. So um, churn has dropped, but it's, I think, as COVID settled in, customers are just demanding more and having more power. And we've really just got to try and... Um, Service becomes, service, more service becomes more important. We need to detect and help those and to help our customers, help our clients reach out to customers proactively when they need it. So it's really more the customer has more much much more of a voice during COVID, um, and our enterprise customers we need to equip them better to be able to service customers proactively that need it. Although I have, a, well, it's just a perception, not a science, that uh, some companies also take advantage of COVID to excuse some of their lack of service, um, which, is, um, which is reflecting on the perception that the client uh, has uh, of a company because some clients expect more from some companies, like from telco companies, during COVID times, because during COVID times, the communications increased a lot. And so the, the excuse is that we do not have enough staff or the excuses for COVID, because one of the, the, the perceptions that COVID brought is that the world is not perfect. Life is not perfect. Na nothing is perfect. So the client has also to cope with lack of perfection from our service, from our company. Don't, don't you have... Uh, uh, a similar well, there was, yeah, there was in um, energy retail, there was everybody's working from home, so everybody's spending more on their power bill, and at the same time, the regulators saying during these tough times you can't disconnect services. So we did see some different behaviours with churn when the regulator at the end of it said, "Okay." Because you can imagine there's a complication if the retailer isn't allowed to cut the customer off, even though they haven't paid their electricity bill, that retailer still has to pay the distributor and pay the generator. So there was all these flow on impacts and huge complexities from COVID in the supply chain for the energy retailer. So we saw at the end of April, it was, we saw a huge spike in churn and it what it was is the energy retailers were allowed to finally cut off those customers that hadn't paid during COVID. And that because the regulator had said, you can't cut power off um, to customers during COVID and because it's extraordinary circumstances. Yeah. Uh, and the, the, the point you bring up about um, call centres not being available as, as much and the resourcing was lower, it was, it was genuine. Like there, there were a lot of uh, call centres for, for this part of the world, there were a lot of call centres in, in Manila and the Philippines and other places, and they were badly impacted, right? All of those call centres pretty much shut down. They, were, they weren't there. Um, uh, so, yes, there, there were definitely um, challenges for a lot of um, large enterprises. Um, uh, but if you think about it carefully, um, the advantage that you could tap into is if you know who's at risk and who needs more attention, you can focus your resources, right? You don't have to do the old style where you had to sort of spread your resources across a larger space. You can focus those resources. And if you really know who's at risk, you can potentially proactively reach out and prevent a lot of the inbound calls, right? Mm. So you can actually proactively, you know, um, anticipate, um, um, make the, cu the customer feel more valued, um, mm. potentially offset 
um, um, the I want to I want to churn or I want to leave or oh you didn't get this right I've got enough time to pour over my bill in detail because I'm sitting at home so <laughs> so you can so you can get proactive know your objective right very good so tell us about uh, your goals for this partnership smart measure as a Bridgewater participant well as we said before you know we have a, a, um, a, a client in Australia who, whose parent is in Europe and, and there has been some early discussions and interest. Now, that alone um, doesn't cover it. What we were interested in when we first started talking to you guys was that philosophically we were aligned. You know, we did believe in growth and the levers of growth and the four levers of growth in the retention space was something that we believed that we can contribute to. And so, you know, we were definitely interested in working with Bridgewatt to offer that retention capability to, into the um, participants of Bridgewatt. Uh, coincidentally, a couple of years ago, we, um, we submitted our trademark for smart measures in the EU. So we always intended to Come, in, come into the EU and we probably would have tried to do that earlier had it not been for COVID, but we've kind of been in lockdown for a couple of years now. So we're interested in um, leveraging this partnership and working with you to assist your um, participants, so the Bridgewater participants and helping them grow in, in, in the space of retention, yeah. customer retention. And it, it, because we've, um, I guess we've been through a few clients, not just the proof of values, but we've been through a few production um, years of production. So we're really confident now on our ability to return an uh, the return on investment. So now that that's sort of better down, our product's a lot more mature than it was three years ago. We're probably, and, and we, you know, we're confident that for every dollar that gets spent, we usually, if, every month, return three times that, right? Three times return on investment every month. That's where we're confident about now uh, because our product's stable and we know what we're doing. Um, so we're ready. Yeah. Um, and we'll, we'll use you know, yeah. the NG um, channel, hopefully, um, to leverage into their other European divisions. And right. then from there, love to love your levers of growth love that it's great it's really aligned um so we're keen to work with bridgewatt to further that um, if if we had to ask you what would be your priority sectors to work with um what would be the answer because uh, you you mentioned the ng case which is more related to energy but you also tackled financial services and other sectors uh, can you explain us a bit what would be your uh, priorities? Um... It, telco is another one. So telco or cable or internet companies, um, as well as energy retail and, and um, financial services. But if there's businesses that is in the intro that Mike talked about that do have more than a couple of hundred thousand customers, that these are B2C businesses um, and that they have data about each customer and customers engage with them fairly regularly. Um, these could be retailers that have store cards or you know, retail membership loyalty cards. Um, then we could look at those, but they need to have churn um, and a definition for churn. So if you're a transactional business like a retailer, if they define churn as a customer hasn't purchased off us in the last three months, then that's we would predict for that. So if you've if they define their own churn as something more than about 15 to 18 percent a year, and they've got more than a couple of hundred thousand customers, and they do want to retain those customers with service messages, um, then we'd be interested in talking to them. Health insurance in Australia is another one that we've, we're, we're looking at because the cost to replace a health insurance customer is high. Um, and 
In Australia, though, the churn isn't probably high enough. It's probably around between 12 and 15 percent. So or maybe even lower, 8 and 15 percent. So it doesn't really warrant it in Australia. So churn has to be high, a couple of hundred thousand customers. And you're looking to predict um, for some out, outcome and then you can, as we said, marry a treatment plan up with that to in order to proactively retain a customer that's potentially at risk of leaving. Okay. Uh, one of the things that I, I think Bridge brought, uh, brought you uh, was a window to enter the Spanish and Portuguese market. Uh, um, what are your plans for these markets? Um, pretty much what we answered before with, we did register our trademark in the EU a couple of years ago. We do want to work with Bridgewatt to identify target customers in Portugal and Spain, but we do have this other avenue of looking with an existing client that has an operation in, their head office is in France, but they have operations in Europe. Um, we would be looking to work with them as well uh, to come into 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 the EU. I, I was highlighting this question again because you are an Australian company and uh, we are here talking as, as if you were in the neighborhood. So yeah, this, yeah. this is also a sign of times because yeah, people do, must right. not forget yeah. that you, you are yeah. an Australian company. <laughs> what time is, is it uh, right now there? Actually, <laughs> it is um, 8 p.m. And what time is it oh. there, Paolo? Yeah, it's 10 p.m. in Madrid and now 9 p.m. in in Lisbon. So a.m. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Right. That, that, right. We just woke up. I was going to bed. Thinking about the yeah. neighborhood. Well, <laughs> to, your, to your point, we have we have delivered a couple of projects completely remotely. You know, never met the people. It helped. We're in the same. You know, we know their offices are just up the road here from where we are. But we haven't <laughs> but been in their there. offices. Um, you know, we have done it completely remotely. One yeah. we did was from Melbourne to Perth, which is 3,600 kilometres. Um, when COVID first hit, we were sent home and then we quickly learned how to deliver remotely. But, but yeah. you're right, Paolo, we're talking like, uh, it, but it's about relationships, right? Yes. It's a, a lot of it's about relationships. Yes, so, it's, it's, just, just yeah. before you go... Uh, on the mic, Mike, one of the things that I think uh, we brought is this proximity. Being in Bridgewater is also about relationships and proximity. So it yes. will be in process, uh, uh, is my vision, okay? Uh, it will be very difficult at least to address companies without having something in the middle that could create a sort of hub uh, for, uh, tackling some markets, even if yeah. the hub is di digital, but sometimes people do not uh, resonate about the importance of having these hubs, okay? That's yeah. right. Correct. That's yes. exactly right. Yes. You know, and, and being aligned in terms of your philosophy, we understand, you know, not to harp on the levers of growth, but the levers of growth are important, obviously, for success in a business. And a lever of growth, four levers of growth that we're particularly passionate about are those in the retention group? Yeah. Um, so yes, yeah, we're that... yeah, yeah. And, and I think I think Bridgewater definitely would help us because nobody nobody knows our brand in Europe, right? This is that's <laughs> where you guys add value for us. Um, you, you help us uh, help companies realize because you you've spoken to us for quite a while, right? You have an idea of what we do and etc. So you can add credibility to for those. Uh, potential enterprises that are looking for solutions. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Awareness of brand, awareness of services. If, and if we consider that we currently yes. already have 10 different nationalities within our platform, having had so, such little time, yeah. it's really yeah. approaching people and making yeah. business uh, something that people can relate to, no matter where they are, even, even if some of us are waking up and others are going to bed. So to finish in, in, in a good terms of philosophy we're a gross platform this is what we aim at uh and we would like to close it by having your personal definition of gross having said that this was 
an amazing opportunity to listen to you both with the passion that you put in, into what you do and the way you speak about smart measures, your clients and your business. Okay. Um, well, our definition of growth is obviously retaining customers and growing customer numbers, but it's not just about customer numbers. It's about having the right customers and retaining the right customers and letting the others who are not so good drift away. So growth for us is increasing good customers, revenue and profit. So that's our definition is obviously in the retention space. Very good. So Mike Libby, it was a pleasure having you with us and listen to S uh, Smart Measures experience. Smart Measures is a participant of Bridgewater because as us, well, your objective is ambitious growth. If growth is also your priority, know more about us through our Bridgewater.com website, watch our videos on YouTube and follow us on LinkedIn. See you soon. Bridgewater, let's grow.